David Waltman. Hey, good morning, everybody. How you doing? It is, uh, what the hell is it today? Tuesday, January 4th, 2022. Just trying to keep up with things here. Um, it's, uh, another snow day here. So terrific. Good news for us. That means, uh, no coronavirus gets into the house probably until at least late tomorrow at the earliest. And we begin feeling its effects on Thursday morning. So just scheduling our coronavirus uh, pandemic here in k in the Morning World Headquarters. Apparently a good idea to cancel school for a number of reasons. Uh, still suffering the effects of the winter storm that came through here. Apparently uh, all of uh, the uh, stretch of I-95 throughout the northern, well really the whole length, uh, top to bottom, not the longest way, but necessarily of crossing the state, but top to bottom, north to south, closing I-95 for enormous stretches where ice formed on the roadway and uh, cars and trucks all spun out blocking the roadway and there was no way through. I just got through glancing through a long tweet from a reporter who spent something like 12 hours, just basically spent overnight on the road and uh, tweeting his way through it and Wondering, people around me are running out of gas, they're turning their cars off to save gas, but it's cold outside and turning them off and on intermittently. Is it safe to stay in the car? We don't know what to do. And, uh, well, you know, it's a typical problem, uh, winter travel. It's uh, it's awful. I mean, I guess really, uh, well, down here in Virginia, people generally speaking aren't prepared. I don't think we are necessarily. We may have a blanket or two in the car maybe a few stray water bottles uh, just because but yeah you should have an emergency kit in your car no matter where you live i guess appropriate for the climate there although climate's changing so i don't know exactly what you pack for that but i just saw that uh, senator tim kane was among the people trapped on the roadway so ordinarily you'd think uh i don't know the vips are trapped on the roadway they'll send somebody to do something about it and I don't know whether he tried to leverage any of that or not, but Tim Kaine says here, I started my normal two-hour drive to D.C. at 1 p.m. yesterday. 19 hours later, I'm still not near the Capitol. My office is in touch with the Virginia Department of Transportation. They tried that. To see how we can help each other and help other Virginians in this situation. Uh, Please stay safe, everyone. Good idea. Dangerous conditions out there. Uh, We had some dangerous conditions here outside of World Headquarters, and, you know, you encounter that danger when you go out there yesterday. I guess I I had my first uh, old man slips and falls on the ice incident yesterday. I've slipped and fallen on ice as a young man, but uh, I'm old now. And, uh, but thankfully not old enough that it becomes a real problem. I suppose the same fall that I had yesterday in 20 years I guess is broken hip or broken something. I suppose I fell very well and uh, remembered all my falling techniques, I guess. Uh, But I mean, this was just, it was absurd. I don't usually fall at all. I mean, I have pretty good balance, pretty good uh, reflexes. And I suppose that's what kept me from really getting hurt even with this fall. But this was one of the stupid, like cartoon banana peel fall, like literally walking along. And then all of a sudden, hey, my feet, they're over my head and I don't know what's going on. But I managed to not hit my head, kept my head up during the fall. That's good. Threw my arms out. Threw out all the mail. I had gone to get the mail. Very important. There was all garbage, by the way. All got thrown out. There was no reason to go there at all. Um, But, yep, stepped on a patch of ice and zoop, and it was all gone. And it wasn't one leg. It was both. And all of a sudden, I'm on my back. And I haven't been walloped like that in a long, long time. Uh, I guess probably since playing rugby in college, nothing's hit me that hard and uh, all over my body all at once. But okay, I'm all right. Didn't hit my head. No cuts or bruises that I can tell. Uh, Fall sideways though, you know, plus 20 years and it's a broken hip and who knows what. So 
uh, don't get the mail in the ice if you don't have to, I guess. I, it's my best. I don't know what. Uh, or go during the daytime and I don't know what. Yeah, ice, can't see it. Uh, so tough conditions out there. But we plow forward, no pun intended, because uh, I didn't get hurt that bad. That's good news. k in the Morning Radio Show, which is what you're listening to now, is live. Bill tells me all the way from Portland, Maine. Bill, come get my mail, and uh, then I'll be okay. What's he got to say? Well, let's find out what we're doing today. I actually know. There's a whole plan and everything. But let's see. The Senate might actually be preparing to do something. That's true, and that's why we'll have Joan McCarter later on. In the program, k X helps prepare you for such a rare occasion intellectually and emotionally because that's what he does when he's not slipping and falling on the ice. Uh, so we'll get around to that. Yes, uh, true. We did hear some rumors of Senate action happening yesterday, and Greg informed me uh, after his segment on the show, sent me a couple of clips that indicate that Chuck Schumer is, um, well, making the rounds and... Pardon me, I had to take a brief sneeze pause there. <laughs> so uh, I fell on the ice and got a cold as well. Uh, so let's see. Chuck Schumer making the rounds discussing the possibility uh, or the perhaps inevitability of a Senate vote in the near future on a cloture rules change, the nature of which I am not entirely clear on, and they may not be entirely clear on, but aimed at getting a voting rights protection legislation, a, a bill through on uh, on that subject. And it seems he's got most of the Democrats behind it. Of course, the big question mark are uh, Manchin and Cinema, but they're, I don't know whether this is, I've got movement from them or I've got a narrow window from them on a narrow type of reform or whether it's I'm doing this to force them to, you know, come out and state their position once and for all, and we're going to put pressure on them. But we'll be discussing that, I'm plus a number of other things, I'm sure, with Joan later on. Uh, earlier in the program, like eh, pretty much now at this point, we can, we'll make this, this shift. Armando's going to join me. As you know, if you've been following him on Twitter, he's been on a bit of a tear about the uh well for a long time really about the electoral count act and the need for reform there and it's become a hot topic in the last couple of days i think largely based on peter navarro's weird claims that he could have and meant to pull off trump's coup entirely peacefully and that the protest outside of the capitol that then broke out into a riot was detrimental, in fact, to his efforts. And that's how you know that he's totally not guilty of anything having to do with it, because he didn't want it, because he was going to do this whole thing peacefully. And as I pointed out, you know, pretty much immediately after he said it, now, I mean, you should be, have been assuming, and maybe this is a failing uh, on the part of a lot of us, um, and members of the press in particular, you should have been assuming right from the beginning that Navarro's story was a cover story and that he was looking to exonerate. I mean, he went ahead and said, my story exonerates not only me, but Trump and the rest of the inner circle because we had a plan that called for doing this peacefully. And it was the riot and protest and insurrection that broke up the plan and cost us the ability to do this correctly. And now I see this morning, because Armando was ranting about it this morning, that, uh, who was it, Amanda Carpenter, who's, you know, anti-Trump enough, as Republicans go anyway, uh, insisting that, yeah, well, there's a real danger here. And there is, because Nav <clears throat> Navarro's plan could have worked legally and peacefully, uh, except it ignores the situation on the ground in 2020 and early 2021, um, which is an important part of uh, not only a complete breakfast, but understanding what went, what went wrong and what went right uh, and how bad the plan really is and what a thin veneer it really is. Uh, it's possible that it could have been done, quote unquote, peacefully with a Republican 
Congress, which is something that you should keep in mind and that Amanda Carpenter should keep in mind because she is, she is, isn't she, a Republican? And uh, uh, the well, we, we went over it a couple of days ago. Essentially, the Navarro plan, it's the same as the Eastman plan. It's not a very big deal and not a very big difference. If you're familiar with that one, you're familiar with this one. And it depended on Pence making a ruling to which he's not entitled under statute or under the Constitution to simply decide on the fate of various electoral college slates from the states that are being objected to, uh, which is a thing he can do physically. He can try and make that ruling. He can try and say this is the way it's going to be. But as I pointed out the other day, all it takes is for members of Congress to object to the ruling, to say it has no basis in law or uh, parliamentary rules or in the Constitution, and that they want to appeal the ruling of the chair. And although they're in a joint session <clears throat> where ordinarily such debate and votes would not be permitted, you can also make the motion that the Senate recede to its chamber and the House resolve into the House and that both chambers debate and then vote on whether or not to overrule the chair in this situation. There's not a lot of mechanics laid out in the Electoral Count Act or anything else as to what to do, but we know this much. They try not to allow debate and voting in a joint session because they don't know what that animal is. It's neither House nor Senate, and though it's comprised of members of both, they don't really have any rules or procedures there, so they split up and they have the vote. It's unclear what would happen if, say, one house voted to sustain the ruling of the chair and one house voted to overturn the ruling of the chair, my guess is that at that point you have no majority, so whatever motion was made fails, even though it was a tie, and there's no, there's no tie-breaking vote that I know of as between the two houses. Uh, just as if you pass a bill, you know, in the House, and then it's sent to the Senate and it fails, the bill fails. There's no majority, there's no agreement in Congress to send the thing on. And there's only two houses, so the math isn't difficult to tell whether or not you have gotten a majority. Uh, and in, I guess in the case of the two houses, you actually need unanimity between the two in order to pass a bill. But that's only because the numbers we're talking about are one and one. And that's easy to deal with. But, yeah, they blow right past it. And uh, Carpenter, I think, makes a mistake. And eh, you know, it's not uncorrectable. And she might even acknowledge the mistake and say, yeah, 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 right. Um, what I'm talking about is that in 2024, if uh, or after the 2024 election, if there's Republican majorities in both houses, it may be that the Republicans there are so craven and corrupt that they would be willing to go along with such ruling, except that this time the ruling would be being made by Kamala Harris, and it's unlikely that she would do that. And by the way, if she were to try and exercise the power that Navarro currently and Republicans currently claim Pence had, some Republicans anyway, uh, of course... They would object. I mean, you, all you really need to do to solve the problem of is Navarro telling the truth and describing accurately what was going on so that someone like Carpenter can conclude, yes, this can be done peacefully, is ask, OK, suppose this happens in 2024 and Kamala Harris says uh, Joe Biden won or whoever, you know, if, if you're one of the fantasists and you need to indulge the possibility that there's a different Democratic nominee for whatever reason. That person won. And, and and if that person has not won, ask yourself what Ted Cruz does. And obviously he stands up and he blathers about something and he insists on some votes and some votes happen. Uh, the whole thing disturbs me a great deal because the whole premise is supposed to be, and people are being credulous of this premise, that this could have been done uh, in 2021, January 6, 2021, peacefully and legally. And that's a lie. Violence and the threat of violence underlay the whole thing. And the only answer for what happens when Pence says, well, I rule X and somebody else says, well, I appeal the ruling of the chair. What ends up happening, the plan at that point was either to uh, threaten the use of force to make people stop saying they object and just saying whatever you say, Mr. Pence, or 
and this was really the plan, and it was always the Eastman plan as well, there never really was any need for any ruling from Pence. What they were really looking for was enough delay in debating the validity of electoral college certificates that were received by uh, by Pence and were being read in the joint session, that there would, you would split up into the two houses and debate the validity of every single state in order to give those state legislatures enough time to show everyone how peaceful things were and how legal everything was, and that would coerce the legislatures of six-plus states to uh, override everything and do all the same, you know, make the same illegal maneuvers in the states, which I guess is, you know, also possible because they would be Republican-dominated. But there's no mechanism for doing any of the things that they want to do. They would simply be doing those either by force, that is, say, uh, forcing their legislatures to do it by violent protest, or simply saying, you know, by fiat, and then sending that to the United States Capitol and then having people say, yeah, we'll just count these from now on. It <laughs> ignores, you know, it ignores the fact that it was a Democratic Congress. And that Pence not only would have to rule that those certificates that he liked best should be admitted, but that there was now also no role for Congress here in Congress. That the members can't speak up and say, I don't think that ruling is right and we ought to vote. It's absurd. And I don't really know why they're missing it. Uh, but I guess it's a part of a fantasy to try to preserve the idea that uh, there was something uh legal or peaceful about what was going on there on January 6th. And I don't know why any Republican would be interested in doing that unless you were pro-Trump. And she's supposed to be anti-Trump. So what's happening? So Armando is here, not necessarily with that part of the agenda in mind, but rather, well, but you could certainly focus on it. Yeah, but can, yeah. can I chime in on that? Because no, they, that's just, you know, <laughs> even the whole show is me. Sent, yes. If, even if they had, the state legislatures had sent in, you know, competing uh, certificates, by yes. the way, not on the date that they were supposed to. Oh, and right. They didn't true. show up at the electoral oh, college. Yeah, that's, true. that's another bad problem. On uh, the date that's set up. So, Safe you know, the, their the particular votes would not have been, quote, regularly given because mm -hmm. they didn't follow the the, the Constitution or the or the uh, federal law, right. the Electoral Count Act, which uh, we'll talk yeah. about later. Uh, make a note even to if here. you ignore all that. Mm -hmm. There is, in fact, written in the law a tiebreaker, which is ah. the governor's certificate prevails. So okay, you know, that's true even too. if he had controlled them, there was no lawful way to do it. And no. even there wasn't even a contrived way to do it. Trump is just crazy and stupid. No one questions that Trump is crazy and stupid. That's no true. one questions that Trump is surrounded by crazy and stupid people. That's not the issue, in my I opinion. I agree. The issue is he is an absolute ruthless authoritarian, and uh, and not every ruthless authoritarian is smart or has a good plan, but they're willing okay. to do whatever to get what they want is the point. Yes, it was always a matter of him just saying, well, what if we just did the opposite of what we're supposed to do? Well, that's a good question. I mean, and the answer is supposed to be, well, you're you're not no one agrees with you and you're bounced out of office or if you bring troops with you we fight you and arrest you and i mean everywhere else in the world at any other time in the world execute you when right. we're done right later on i'd love to go through some of the things we were talking about about what happens when the chair rules in a certain way uh you you talked about pence ruling and i've yeah. always said you know the, the the next chair of that session is going to be kamala harris yes what happens when she rules? Yeah, uh, right. Well, now, of course they object. That's horrible. But, and, but let's check that because yeah. the one the one way in federal law that Trump can overturn an election lawfully and constitutionally hmm. is enshrined in Section 15. It's a line that it comes after much verbiage about what's supposed to happen and what's conclusive and what certificates have to, cannot be rejected 
Uh, for, for example, this is my favorite line in the whole thing. Hmm. No electoral voter votes from any state which shall have been regularly given by electors hmm. whose appointment has been lawfully certified wow. according to Section 6 of this title. Section 6 is the certificates they send to the National Archive that we all watched uh, or looked at uh, every day oh, yes. uh, at that time. From which but one return has been received shall be rejected. That is – You can't reject those. Okay, so people hung their hat on regularly given. Mm -hmm. But but the the phrase isn't regularly given at at the time of the election. It's regularly given by the electors at the electoral college. Ah, well, yeah, that makes a difference. We know who those people were. We watched them on TV. We know they were. We know they voted. They were were there. It was regularly given. That never was the argument. The argument was it was fraud in the election itself. And mm-hmm. there actually doesn't give you a chance to to, to overturn it. According to this, uh, even if there was a fraud but it was certified, you need to win that case in court. You can't win it in Congress mm-hmm. according to this. All right? Maybe, so yeah. that wouldn't have worked either. But, but at the end of the day, what happens with all this verbiage about Section 5, you know, the, safe, the famous safe harbor – Section six, uh, the certifications. What happens hmm. uh, a, a, after all these things that, that supposedly uh, are conclusive? Ordinarily, you mean, or after we've accepted the certificates? Okay, that every, all of that shall be counted. Okay. Uh, blah blah blah. Unless. The two houses acting separately shall concurrently decide such votes not to be lawful votes of the legally appointed electors of such state. You can conclude. So after all these protections and all these rules and all these things you put in, but (laughs) the House and the Senate can do what they want, can do what they want. Yeah, that's unconstitutional. The, that uh, phrase in this uh, law is unconstitutional. I've said this a million times. Yeah. You know, I bored everybody too, but it's unconstitutional. The state send their electoral votes. The Congress can't overrule the state's electoral votes. It can't do that. Hmm. That's unconstitutional. There's nothing in the Constitution that gives the Congress that power. So what is the basis of, of whatever Congress is doing? Well, it's the 12th Amendment. And what happens? They convene. And they, quote, count the votes. They don't discount the votes. They count them. <laughs> That's an interesting. They don't judge too, the votes. Yeah. They're not They're the judge of the votes. They do whatever they want. Yeah. I, I mean, uh, it, it seems like there's at least contradictory thought out there about, well, uh, you know, on the one hand, you the, the general assumption is, well, inside of Congress, what happens, happens. And a majority rules and, and there's very... Little you can do about it if they come to a certain conclusion and everyone disagrees with it. Um, you know, there's even the possibility that, well, could a court overrule them? Well, they might not be able to impose Article 3, may not be able to impose itself right. on Article 1. Well, I don't well, know. Well, you're, you're but you have to back resolve to that this. Kyle Cheney article about uh, yeah. amending the Electoral Count Act because, hey, the Electoral Count Act can't even be enforced on Congress. So the, the theory that Kyle Cheney is propounding there is – Two, that Congress can't pass a law that applies to itself, which I just think is wrong. Uh, another Congress can repeal that law uh, by the proper processes. Uh, it, it's sort of an independent Congress uh, theory, you know, it, uh, as opposed mm-hmm. like the independent state legislature theory that the right wing liked for, uh, you know, you can't change the election law and blah, blah, blah uh, by, by court order. Uh, there's this notion that Congress is an entity unto itself and nothing, no law can apply to it. All right. Suppose that's true. And I don't agree, but suppose that's true. Mm -hmm. Okay. Does the constitution apply to Congress? Because lots of laws get stricken down. True. I mean, uh, how Congress, how each house of Congress runs itself. I kind of agree is sort of outside the bounds of anybody else's intervention Mm -hmm. the senate makes its own rules the house makes its own rules right yeah i mean uh, beyond the need for a majority vote and you know the tie vote provisions and that we talked about yesterday the president vote uh, the senate breaks the tie or the vice president breaks the tie um 
you know, whatever is in there. But it's pretty bare bones. And in fact, you know, there there is one case about the House deciding who can be a member. Yeah. And of course, that was the Adam Clayton Powell case. And I still think that's it, that area is a little murky. And I, I think yeah. it's problematic that Congress can say. And, the, you know, I know there's the expulsion stuff and we have that. But, you know, if you won the election, you get seated before you get expelled. Right. You would think. Yeah. I mean, uh, but yeah, there's ways to, you know, cast that into a gray area. And uh, we're not sure exactly that this would be resolved. I don't know that it would be resolved the same way today, uh, not only because the current court is crazy, but you're also likely to be handing them. Uh, honestly, most likely to be handing them a case of a of a fellow Republican, and they'll distinguish it somehow from from Powell's case. I I understand that, I, and I, yeah. I'm just I, I'm presuming good faith, and everybody's trying to really figure out what yeah. what's well, supposed to happen. Yeah. And with the idea that the Electoral Count Act can't be enforced. Mm-hmm. I, I think that's just wrong because Congress in its 12 year, what is Congress doing there? It's quote counting the votes. That's its function. It is not yeah. making laws. It True. is not running as a house or a Senate. Uh, their, their rules don't actually apply. That's why they make a resolution, a joint resolution mm-hmm. of how they're going to run the session. Right. So he yes. says, Oh, well they make this joint resolution and that's what they apply. That, in my sense. opinion, the joint resolution doesn't need to include the provisions of the electoral count act. It just needs to say, how are we going to run this session? Now mm. they, they do basically repeat the electoral count act in these resolutions. Yeah, they do. We've got to take a uh, break in just a minute but, here, but, but I don't think they have to, to have the law apply to them. Anyway, I heard your music. Yeah. So. All right. Well, we'll leave it at the at here at the moment. We'll continue with this uh, on the other side. Yeah. I mean, it's a it's a murky area because it's unclear which principle prevails here that Congress shall make its own rules of proceeding, or that we can decide how we're going to count our electoral votes ahead of time and set real rules. Uh, it's weird. Hi, it's me, David Waldman, the same guy who was just talking to you a second ago. Our Patreon subscription drive is still going strong with over 175 monthly donors who help keep us on the air. If we've helped keep you going during the pandemic, why not return the favor and help us keep going so we can all be together for the next disaster? Patreon.com, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com makes it easy to make secure, recurring monthly contributions to support our show. Patreon.com slash KGROX gets you straight to our donation page. Maybe you'd like to thank us for keeping you sane during the Trump era. Maybe you're looking forward to in-depth explanations of what's going on in the Biden administration. Whatever it is that keeps you listening, we need your help to keep bringing it to you. And hey, if you happen to prefer using PayPal or even the Square Cash app, We're up and running with those options, too. Thanks again, everyone, for all your support. We literally could not do this without you. That if we were hardball, Pelosi could throw everybody out. Why would you do that? True. Okay, well, that's true. We're back now, uh, and it doesn't matter that we just talked about it. We're excited about what's going on, and that's good. It makes for good radio. Uh, Yeah, we we had to continue discussing during the break because... There's no stopping. We left off just by saying, all right, well, there are some weird, murky places in the law where one principle seems to be at odds with another. And that's ordinarily where we would say the judges and justices have to help us sort that out. Now, on the one hand, we don't necessarily trust them to do the right thing anymore. That's a different you know, related story. But we've done that story to death. We could continue on it. But uh, the other thing is uh, there's some question again here among legitimate judges and legitimate justices they sometimes question how much can we impose our decision on a separate and and co-equal branch of government uh so we started talking about analogies to this which was uh that you can uh there are cases about the uh, ability of a house of congress to refuse to seat someone who has purportedly been duly elected to Congress. As you said, Adam Clayton Powell gets elected despite all sorts of, uh, you know, accusations and, and, and valid accusations of 
corruption. Uh, no one doubts that the Constitution gives the House the right to expel Powell, but don't you have to seat him first and then expel him and then by two thirds and then no one would dispute it. But the the issue at hand, what they were trying to draw analogies to is uh, other cases that they have had more frequently than you would think of disputed elections in certain uh, congressional districts where yeah, two I, I people show up. Two, at least there was okay. that Indiana race where mm -hmm. they basically did a recount in the House. Yeah, Indiana 8th District. Uh, yeah, uh, just one of those famous districts that you remember as the bloody eighth, where they kept going back and forth for several years. The, the, it was a true swing district, and it went back and forth, and they were just unclear as in the district as to who had actually won this seat. And some officials said the count was done properly, and this guy won. Others said, well, the count was done improperly, and we should redo it. The other guy probably won, and it, it, it came to the point where the House – had to decide, well, they could have declined, but they, they opt, opted to exercise the power that they're given. They do have the right to determine how the body will be constituted to a certain extent. Then the, the Powell case reminded everybody that, well, there are certain rules that they have to stay within. If, uh, if there's a legitimate election and people legitimately vote for a terrible person, that's not something you can you can't just deny them their seat that's well you're not supposed to well the, the electoral college theory anymore. could have denied <laughs> the yeah. presidency well but. right but this is there was a distinguishing factor in all of this and uh as we were discussing is in the, yeah in, i mean to me the the difference and the the first of all there's an express uh provision of the constitution that that gives the house and the senate the power to review uh to be the judges of the elections so they yes. have that power to express uh, as a con constitutional body there's a house that's created by the constitution there's a senate that's created by the constitution and then they've been granted this power but the the power there's not a power to judge elections per se not the elections themselves here uh and in fact i don't think there's any power Greg, let's remember what the Twelfth Amendment actually says. I don't. It says the vote, the certificates will be open and the votes will be counted. Ah, yeah, shall then be counted. Now, you want to stretch that into saying, well, we get to review the authenticity of those votes. Okay, I'll give you that. Hmm. And yeah, you that actually to. goes where the Electoral Count Act is uh, empowered by the Constitution. If you view that, okay. So, what mm. does that mean? Well, if you read the Electoral Count Act and you take uh, seriously, it says that to make sure that the votes of the electors were regularly given. Well, no one's again, no one has ever questioned that the votes of the electors, certainly not in 2020, were regularly given. Mm -hmm. You're you're challenging the underlying election of those electors uh, is is yeah, what right. you're getting at. And, that and might be there's no the power to do that. that. Yeah, you, you make a good case that it's outside the scope of what they're empowered to do. Were these votes regularly given? Well, yeah, they were, but they shouldn't have, those shouldn't have been the people giving the regular vote. Uh, yeah, I know, but that's not the question. That question was supposed to be settled by the states. Exactly. The state gets to of, tell you. Which, which makes sense. By the way, this is the this state's rights federalist position. <laughs> system, right? Yeah, state's it rights, sense. damn it. The states decide who the votes are. <laughs> Right. Suddenly we're on the side. They of the don't even race. have to have an election. Remember that, that is they true. don't have to have an election. They could pass a law and say the Republican candidate gets our votes. Yes. No they matter just what. have to do that ahead of time. That's all. They have to do it before the day appointed to so, to vote for those electors. Yeah. You can't uh, just have an election and then say, oh, well, you know, now that we lost. We've changed our minds. You really can't. That's why the whole notion of, well, I was sending it back to the legislature mm -hmm. uh, doesn't work. Uh, you know, there is a provision, again, in the Electoral Count Act, which, you know, depending on the, 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 the Trump theory was through Eastman was that the Electoral Count Act is unconstitutional. So they really couldn't do that anyway. But there is a provision in the Electoral Count Act. If you didn't make the choice on the day appointed, you get a second chance to try again. Okay. Now, Again, there's nothing in the Constitution that I think empowers that. So, you, 
but it's common sense enough to to say, well, if you didn't choose, but they did choose. Like if there's natural and you didn't like the choice, or... so you want to change. Yes. And yeah. There's no power That's to do at that. The bottom of it, and uh, yeah, I mean it's a it's a a very strange mix of reads on these things, and uh, but there was yeah, there's a lot of other things that we have been through before that are analogous to what's going on here and you would have to borrow from if you were making a a case in front of i don't know what court would be competent to hear it but well i I would make a motion to the chair of the january 6 2025 session that the objections be ruled out of order because uh, the uh, the there it, there is no objection that the elect the votes of the electors were not regularly given uh, and that they do not challenge that these are the uh, properly uh, appointed electors that is that the governor did do that hmm. that there was a certification submitted to the to the Congress and therefore this uh, this objection should be ruled out of order. And I would cite the precedent of uh, Al Gore overruling the objections to the electoral votes in Florida. Hmm. Please rule on my motion, Chair. I know. We'll see what they would Point do. Point of order. As they say. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, it, it would be very interesting. And the, the mechanics of dealing with it would be difficult enough, uh, which you know would probably include if you're making it an objection. You would have to be making the objection in the joint session. And yes, the chair there mean. would be correct in saying, well, there's no debate and there's no voting in the in the joint session. There just isn't. And, you know, you'd say, oh, yeah, yeah, that's right. I That's why I also move that the Senate do now recede and we go back to the bodies and rule on your ruling or whatever it is. But so uh, you're saying the only thing that that you're allowed in the session is to object. Yes. I believe, and the, then I would have to make that motion in my particular body. Yeah, and there, as That's president of the Senate, the vice Honestly. president sitting as the president of the Senate could say he could say I rule yeah, this I, objection yeah. out of order. And that's it, because um, you, if you don't get both houses, you're done. Uh, well, yeah, I mean, but the, the president of the Senate could make that ruling, and then uh, any senator could object and uh, appeal the ruling of the the chair in the Senate, and they would have a vote on that. Okay, how many votes does it take to overrule the chair? Well, just one, if you can get it through. They could try and table the the objection. Uh, oh, is it whatever. a 50-vote margin, or is it a 60-vote margin? Ma- it would be a majority of those present would be able to, to do it. So, I mean, uh, you know, you could pretend it's legal if you also have just a little violence in it, like kill a senator or two. <laughs> And then say, but you know, a majority of those present. The other one wasn't present because he was in pieces in the in the back. Uh, but that's legal, right? No, well, I mean, no, it's still rooted in violence. But so it's yeah. interesting because then the ruling of the chair basically is the ultimate. Uh, I mean, the ruling, the vote on the ruling of the chair becomes the ultimate de- desire because at the end of the yeah. day, they could have overruled. You know, if you're going to not overrule the. If you're going to overrule, not overrule the chair, you could just vote against the objection and it's over. Yes. I mean, yeah, so there's several ways to defeat the objections being made. But, yeah, all you can do in But the, you'd save yourself an hour of stupid talking time. Yeah. Yes, true. Uh, or two hours. But, yeah, I mean, I guess they're entitled to two hours per objection or per state. For which there are right, objections. Right. So uh, in theory, you could yeah. stretch it out a hundred. And that's hours. what they were really looking for. Was uh, you know Navarro's thing is window dressing. The idea that it could have been done legally, like I said, is uh, in this situation is is foolish because Pence rule, pretends to rule something. Somebody says you can't rule that. I object. I appeal the ruling of the chair. I, I move that we now separate into our two houses and the House. Because it's majority Democratic just says, yeah, we vote to overrule Uh, the Senate split 50 50 even at that point. I guess there's some question about whether or not the chair gets to rule on the question of his own ruling. But I guess they've they've had that issue before in the Senate and they would know what to do by precedent. But um, it's not clear to me in this situation as we were presented with it that all 50 Republicans go along with Pence. But you you don't want to have to rely on them. 
But there's a pretty good chance that Murkowski and Romney, for instance, and maybe some others say, nah, this is really not a good idea. And we're well, not going to do I, it. I, 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 I would short circuit it by, uh, 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 by amending the Electoral Count Act to uh, make any objections – to electoral votes that are compliant with Section 5 and Section 6, which, by the way, if you go through there, that's the tiebreaker. Mm -hmm. So it really substantively doesn't change the result. It's just enough of this nonsense. Uh, it, I mean, as, as a question of substance, because as, as we've just determined, it mm -hmm. still has this power where, I'll, you know, whatever else is in there, we can just vote majority for whoever we want. Um, and, and as a pure power play, the, 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 if you take these things seriously, then the election of the president is really decided by who gets elected to be in the Congress. Mm -hmm. Oh, except unless there's a special election that occurs the day before January 6th, because when I <laughs> right. we, I kept saying that the Democrats controlled the Senate, but that wasn't true at the time yeah, McConnell that's, did. That's true. Uh, because the two elected senators mm -hmm. uh from Georgia, they were senator elects the day of that. That's true. Yeah, they weren't. Uh, uh, well, the important part, they weren't sworn in yet. They weren't sworn in yet. Uh, by the they way, weren't so able a, to seat. There's a trick at for the, you. Uh, you know, Loeffler and uh, yeah. Purdue. All right, uh, that's I true. I think we're going to vote to object at the time. Yes, uh, Loeffler was there and said she was going to, and then she changed her. Vote after, after the after the riot, right. or so the she was definitely she, there. Uh, she changed her vote. Right, so that's so, a good point. I forgot about that, but uh, although that, that, that's a great question, then for the uh, Federalist Society types who rejected my theory on uh, who's seated and sworn and who isn't in the Senate a couple of years ago, and said it was absolutely crazy, but now support this theory that the vice president can just decide who the president's going to be by themselves, essentially. Uh, suppose then the Senate recedes, they go back to their chamber. Where the question now is on the appeal of Pence's ruling that whatever, whatever it is, doesn't really matter what he ruled. It would be something ridiculous that Navarro asks him to rule. So they go back to House. We kind of know what they're going to do unless, you know, like I said, Republicans murder a bunch of Democrats and say, we don't know what happened to them. And everybody says, all right, well, let's just vote. Um, the Senate is... Not evenly split yet because Loeffler and Purdue are there and Republicans are in control. What do the Federalist Society types say if uh, debate goes on for some time? They do, in fact, succeed in pushing debate into the next day. Now, Warnock and Ossoff show Great up question. with certificates of election and the presiding officer does not recognize anyone for the purpose of presenting their credentials so that they can be sworn in. Are Loeffler and Purdue still in the Senate? No, they're not members of the Senate. Their terms have ended. But are there seated Democrats from Georgia? No. So 98 in the Senate. So you need, and does that change the number that we need in order to make a majority? Can we continue debating this without seating these two? Are they not entitled to a vote until I've uh, had them Recite the oath. How long can I keep them out as Mitch McConnell? That's an interesting question. <laughs> I, I hadn't I, considered I, that one. It, it, it's an interesting procedural question, but uh, for electing the president, it's not a question we should be asking. Uh, oh yes, okay, right. I'm distracted. Yeah, I mean, my 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 approach to this is to return to the constitutional function of the Congress in the 12th Amendment, which is to be there to observe the counting of the votes. That mm -hmm. is, if the states complied with their obligations under the Electoral Count Act and did so in time to take advantage of the safe harbor protection, which the Supreme Court in Bush v. Gore and Bush v. Palm Beach County Canvassing Board in 2000 said was a legitimate protection, an enforceable protection. Indeed, they stopped the count mm -hmm. in Florida in December because they said Florida wanted to take 
make sure it got safe harbor protection. If that's the case, if you can fashion a remedy because yes. of this important right. safe harbor right, it has to be real in the view of that Supreme Court. Yes, whatever happened to that one, that Supreme Court. But yes, okay, but yeah. do you understand what I'm saying? I mean, Cheney yes. was saying, "Well, no courts ever just said." Well, actually, the Supreme Court did. Mm-hmm. And he said, "Well, you know, Bush v. Gore wasn't about Section 15." Okay, said, "Of course, it was about Section 15 because that's the only place where you can object to electoral votes." And the answer is Section 5 trumps your ability to object. I mean, it, it, it's. But there's there's no way that you can, in my view, sit, view Bush v. Gore and Palm Beach, the Bush v. Palm Beach case as not saying implicitly it it's, it forms the basis of the opinion for why they stopped the cow basis of the remedy anyway. You can't say that this doesn't isn't enforceable against Congress because basically that's what the Supreme Court would do. Suppose the Congress had been Democratic and said, you know what? We don't care what the Supreme Court decided in Bush v. Gore. Florida, these votes are no good because you stopped the count. We're not taking your certificates. They could have opted to do that, I guess. Yes. I mean. Well, then what's the Supreme Court's hmm. answer? What's Kyle Cheney's answer? Can George Bush go back to the court and say, wait a second, look what Congress did. You'd make them take those certificates. Can Florida do that? I, have I think they must they, be yeah. able to do that. Yeah. Otherwise, what mm. you're saying is we really don't have presidential elections. The Congress decides. Yeah. And uh, <clears throat> I mean, it may be just I, I, I don't know. I mean, it's an interesting theory that well, maybe at bottom that's what's happening. But Congress uh, is Congress, like the current Supreme Court, aware that they are, in fact, political actors and. Uh, in an effort to uh, maintain their legitimacy, all they've been doing all these times, these 45, well, I guess 46. They're political plus, actors, yeah. and that made them observe norms and not overturn elections. <laughs> yes, they have, uh, They agreed to right adopt the thin veneer of the Electoral Count Act and say, uh, people like this whole okay. idea that we laid out rules. And all right, we'll, well, we'll then we're in serious them. jeopardy then, because we know <laughs> yeah. that the Republican Party today doesn't care about those things 142 of them in the house voted to overturn the election some 20 some voted to overturn the election in 2020 and what do you think is going to be would be their restraint in 2024 if they actually have control uh yeah very little they will have none i will remind everybody including amanda carpenter and all of this that there is some Credible reporting that it, at, I don't know how many, but at least some of the 124 members that voted this way, uh, that they only whatever. What was it? 142. 142. I got the numbers backwards there. Reversed them. 142 members. At least some of them have apparently told the press, oh, I only did it because of the threats of violence. I was afraid yep. not to do this. I thought my family was in jeopardy if I didn't do it. So, you know, oh, it was peaceful, except for the members of my own party I threatened with death. But I did it, uh, you know, in a low tone of voice. I used my <laughs> indoor voice to threaten their families. I stormed the Capitol chanting, yes. hang my pets, but there was, you know, it was unfortunate. Yes. It really wasn't the intent. I did not mean that. The feces <laughs> on the wall was very peaceful also, by the way. Right. <laughs> And, yeah, but uh, here, here's yeah. the idea, not just even on a norms basis. If you create, say, listen, we don't want this one six situation anymore. It's a stupid relic anyway. All right. There's no reason to have it. Uh, everyone should just submit their certificates to the National Archives. You should just announce the result. All right. But the but the, you have to create this expectation that this doesn't matter. So Trump can't do anything. And the Congress Mm. can't. So what do you have to Ah. do? You have to say, you, Congress, don't have the power to do this. And the Congress itself should say it. Or at the very least, this is an interesting thought, too. I mean, By uh, by amending the Electoral Count Act is what I'm saying. Yeah, and I think I like the idea now. um, Or, uh, you know, you could build on what's already in there. Let's say there's lots of fans of the Electoral Count Act out there because it's so old and hoary and everyone loves it. Uh, they don't, but okay. Uh, you want to preserve something, and uh, you made a good point in that. There's no reason that the Congress has to do this. It's really was something like, 
Well, the reason they, I guess, assigned the job to themselves, they clearly thought, well, there really needs to be some pomp and circumstance involved here. If it's a ceremony, everyone will buy into it. Um, you know, seems like a good idea. Somebody's got to do the count. It might as well be us. We're writing the law. Who are we going to give the power to ourselves? Um, fine. Okay, sure. But I did notice that they also built in all sorts of redundancies, which some of which became important in the Electoral Count Act. Uh, those electoral certificates, as you pointed out, they go to the National Archivist, too. You could have decided the archivist will tell you who won. But that didn't seem like, well, you know, who's that? We didn't elect that guy. So this has more legitimacy. But we also send them, by the way, to the federal district judges yep. uh, in every district. So there is a there is a reason to think. Well, maybe the judiciary does have some say in all this after all. Otherwise, why are we sending them certificates? Well, I, I think, you know, I think it's a relic of the days when, you know, they used to bring them by, by horse and right, maybe the sure. messenger gets lost or drunk or he drops <laughs> in the toilet, you know. Yeah, could anything could happen. And th that was redundancy that was built in. But, uh, you know, the, the act contemplates, oh, my God, we lost the uh, electoral votes from Montana. They're just gone. We'll call the archivist. Well, he didn't get ours. The guy was drunk. Well, call the federal district court for Montana. They've got it. Right. We do have it. We do have it. He here's has the an answer. official copy as well. Uh, here's the winner, by the way. So now, like, okay, all of it's a, it all comes down. It's a tie, and it all comes down to Montana. But they have to go to the federal district judge in Montana for the answer. Has the federal district court not determined successfully the winner of the presidency? Is that invalid because Congress didn't open the certificate? Right. I think uh, I think that uh, that remember the Twelfth Amendment itself does not put a time as to when Congress has to convene uh, to count the certificates. Uh, you know, at the time, of course, presidents didn't get inaugurated till whatever March or something, yeah. uh, and then they moved the dates up. Uh, you know, the, the, the Electoral Count Act itself, as everybody knows, was a Result uh, mostly of the 1876 election. Of course, there were very close elections in 1884 as well, where the popular vote winner lost, by the way. No, I think he won. The next oh, okay. one is the one he lost. Um, and uh, they, you know, it was that. That was a real crisis based on, you know, real differences and real violence and, uh, and competing slates. And it was truly, you know, a bad moment. So, okay, hey, let's make some rules. Well, they mm -hmm. made these rules in 1887, and some of them are good, and they've revised some of them, and some of them have gotten better. But they now left a hole, which they – because everybody thought the norms would hold, right? Yeah. No one said, you know what? We're never going to declare the guy who lost the winner, are we? We're not going to do that, are we? No one's going to do that. Because then we'd that, be illegitimate. Literally, right after the Civil War, nobody thought that that would happen. Mm -hmm. And then Donald Trump came along. Yeah. And said, well, do, well, maybe we will do that. We don't know what maybe happens if we, we do. Maybe we will do that. And then he found 142 Republicans in the House and some number yeah. uh, in the Senate. And I'm telling you, if you put the same scenario in 2020, I give the same results. It's Biden and basically the same vote count in 2025, except the Republicans control the Congress. Uh -huh. Yeah. How sure are you that the Republican Congress – won't vote Trump president, even though he lost. Yeah, I am not. Um, you got to give it at least a even, one in three chance yeah. that they would they would overturn the election. There, there has to be, if not more. Uh, you know, a lot, uh, people already were afraid for their safety or their family's safety. They've already said they wouldn't have done it if they had felt like they had any choice. I also think that there's a certain number of the 142 who may or may not have felt the same threat, but who said. Uh, what the, this is not going to work. So, so it's, it's a free, free vote. Yeah, free vote. I'll I'll excite I'll the vote base. I'll vote to overturn the election. Yeah. It's my free vote. That that actually is a comment <laughs> in and of itself that you would think that <laughs> You're that's free with the this. free vote you have to take. Yeah. No, this is the vote that we should be able to hang you for if you take lightly. You you know you should be disqualified from right. holding uh, office. I but... just swore three days ago to support and defend the Constitution, but. Only if it counts. If it doesn't okay. count, then F the Constitution. All right. 
I, I know Joan's just around the corner. So if you give well, me no, two no, minutes, but, uh, all yeah. I'm asking for is yes. an amendment that says no objections to any mm-hmm. uh, electoral votes that comply with Section 5 and Section 6 of the Electoral Count. Now, what are those? Those are the safe harbor, make mm-hmm. it a real safe harbor, number one. And number two is the one that's certified by the process in Section 6, i.e. the governor signs it. If those things are true, that, that that is conclusively regularly given and no one can say it wasn't and you're done. You can challenge others or you can say, well, someone sent two competing slates that might be in, in contracts. But if people do, as they all did in 2020, mm-hmm. submit their electoral votes by the safe harbor date, signed by the governor, yes. all the things we saw going into the National Archive, there should be no power, none to entertain an objection. And it should be like when Al Gore in 2000 said you need two senators, said, no, the votes that you are challenging are not subject Mm -hmm. to objection. Your objection is overruled. I don't care how many senators signed. I don't care how many House members signed. Overruled. Now, your your answer is going to be great, but they're going to object to his ruling and and overrule him. Maybe. Maybe Maybe. they will. But the point being that would be less of an expectation created, and it would be just a pure – pure power play no one can wor- argue oh this is legal it's not legal it's very clear that you can't object to these mm-hmm. that's my plan all that's right the best i can come up with yeah because everything else is subject to well what if you know what if everybody just says we're not gonna obey this and we're yeah, what not if the listen? army you know yeah, overthrows right. by i mean there's right. lots of, right. and installs trump i get look we have well, to that's a regular cut, coup. cut yeah. between lawful and unlawful. We have to make the things we don't want to happen be unlawful. Yes. We want to make the things that we All want right. to happen be lawful. So making an objection to compliant electoral votes unlawful is where I would put them. Right now, they're on the other side. As the Electoral Count Act is written, the Congress can overturn an election. Yeah. It's unconstitutional. Fine. But it's in the law. Take that out of the law. That's all I'm saying. All right. Well, that is simple. You probably could have done that a lot faster. But this was – you laid the right <laughs> foundation for it. That's what that's what you have to do, right? And as a, right. as a lawyer, you lay the foundation for it. And yeah, that is a fairly simple solution. And uh, yeah, you could always object. Well, what if the army – okay, well, then that's a regular coup. Then it's not legal and peaceful and Navarro is out of his mind. There. We've done it. Excellent. Well done. Thank you, Armando. <laughs> all right. All right, welcome back now, everybody, to the Cake in the Morning Show here on Edwards Radio. Uh, Armando wishes you all a happy new year, which may not have made it onto the air, so I wanted to pass that on. But I think you probably already assumed Armando's wishes for your happiness and good fortune going forward in calendar year 2022. But if you didn't and you need reassurance, uh, I'm willing to give it to you. I, I swear I totally heard it. It's on tape. It just didn't make it through on the radio. Uh, so I think we've done a good job summing that up nicely. And uh, like I said, it was a pretty basic point in the end, which actually, I mean, I think means that uh, the argument was well made. It might have been difficult to swallow if at first, so, well, okay, hi, good morning, everybody. The Electoral College Act is unconstitutional. Uh, but an acceptable change would be to get all that stuff in there about making objections out, even though you kind of enjoyed seeing it in uh, 2000 and uh, in the film uh, Fahrenheit 9-11. Maybe you enjoyed seeing it happening again in 2004, and uh, uh, but you hated seeing it happen this time. But OK, this laid the nice foundation. And I, I, I think made the argument pretty clear. Yeah, you can. uh Ultimately, get back around, as we said, to the idea, well, what if you do something else, but this one's this is totally illegal? Or what if you just ignore everything and take over the place with the army? Or like I was saying, you know, you're going to have a vote, but you're going to kill some of the members of Congress so that you win the vote. Well, then you're just talking about a regular coup that involves violence. And it just gets back to the original point, which was that no, Navarro didn't have a peaceful legal means in mind. He had a coup in mind that was always underlay, underlain by the threat of violence. Even if he, if his plan contemplated violence as a more distant possibility, it was still had to be a distinct possibility in order for his plan to go anywhere. The whole thing uh, discounts the idea of a, like I said, of a role for Congress 
in Congress. Nobody gets to just hand down a ruling and everybody has to take it in Congress. And, and to the extent that, for instance, uh, Kyle Cheney is correct, and I don't think we've read his article. I commented on it a lot on Twitter, and we've been down that road, and I put it aside somewhere, I think, for discussion, and we never did get to it. But, uh, yeah, here we are. He had a piece in Politico um, back on uh, the first of the year, uh, oh, so over the weekend, efforts to Trump-proof presidential certification crash into congressional realities, which the the point of the article here, yeah, ordinarily I would now read it to you. But, I, excuse me, I need to get uh, a number of other items on the record here for today. But uh, long story short, and Kyle Cheney, uh, well, you can't Trump-proof the presidential election by changing the Electoral Count Act because, in the end, Congress, if they were so inclined, could vote to do basically whatever they want. In contravention to the Electoral Count Act, in compliance with the Electoral Count Act, it wouldn't matter. And that if you appealed it to the courts, the courts might very well say what happens in Congress stays in Congress, essentially. They are the arbiters of their own procedure. And if their procedure led them by majority vote to opt to ignore the uh, Electoral Count Act or whatever, or, or just change some provision of it and how it's applied. Uh, there's nothing we can do to review it, and they can do anything they want. And you know, it's a legitimate worry because there are people who will claim that power and even try to exercise it. And it's not outside of the realm of things that have been argued in this context and other contexts, and and have prevailed. But. Uh, the, you know, the, the question is, how do you get in 2021, how do you get the Congress as then constituted to simply abide by Pence's ruling? And uh, to some extent, the whole thing is a distraction because, you know, Navarro will be happy to have us there debating whether or not, uh, you know, Things are truly peaceful or whether or not there's any underlying threat of violence. But what he really was interested in was the same thing that Eastman was interested in, which was this other part of the operation, which was if we delay long enough, if we debate the validity of enough state electoral count, electoral vote certificates <clears throat> and debate each one of them for two hours or even longer as these things happen to, you know, on the real clock ends up being longer than two hours on each one of these things. There's all sorts of other procedural delays that during that debate period, the states will, you know, make the decision necessary. If you're a state's rights, if you're making even facetiously making the state's rights argument, they will change their electoral slates and send you something new. And then you have to be able to rely on the validity of the Electoral Count Act to say, well, these are not votes that were regularly given you don't have to count them. But, I mean, I guess at some point, yeah, their Congress could say, a Republican Congress might say, yes, uh, these votes are not regularly given, but we don't care. We will say that they are, and there's nothing you can do about it. Yes, okay, that can be done. That's not, you might argue about whether or not it's legal. You might argue about whether or not it's peaceful, and you but but there you might have something and you might say, all right, well, that could be done peacefully uh, if you elect Republicans who are just corrupt top to bottom or who are, you know, I mean, well, actually, we're supposed to discount the possibility of this in this scenario. No one's been threatened and no members of Congress, Republican or otherwise, feel that they are being coerced to vote in favor of this stupid procedure. They just are dumb, so they like it, and they do it. Could that be a problem? Yes, but then that's just a coup. That's just a Congress saying we don't care about the laws that Congress passes because we're either going to start all over again, it's a new era going forward from this point on, or whatever, and then, or, you know, they are, or they're saying we have, see, here, I mean, I think the founders probably figured Congress wouldn't do that because they would say to them, they would have the brains to say to themselves, and these guys would not, the current uh, Congress would not, 
necessarily have the brains to say, well, if we declare that acts of Congress don't matter, then what are we doing here? Why do we want to be members of Congress? Well, we're only here to declare Trump the presidency. And then at that point you say, well, okay, coup complete. There's now no longer uh, uh, co-equal branches here. Uh, this was what the, the founders counted on by dividing the powers of government. They, they've thought, and it turns out incorrectly, that members of Congress would always jealously guard their prerogatives here and say the power that we have is limited. We can't let any of it slip away. We can't grant it to any other branch, especially if that branch is being run by a totalitarian dictator. It would not be wise. But currently, instead... Oh, some good. We got some nice uh, health reminders in the background here, the phone coming through. I wonder why that's not silenced. Anyway, um, at any rate, uh, where was I? Oh, yes, right. Well, if you uh, just adopt, if you elect a Congress that says we're just going to give a president of our party and presumably the last president of the United States all powers or at least everything we have to give them. We might not be able to give them the judicial power, but we might just pretend that they essentially we are giving them the judicial power because we're just going to decide that certain things are and aren't the law. Uh, in his behalf. So we're just going to usurp the power of Article 3 here and then grant it to Article 1 and then we're done. So now you don't, it might be peaceful, no one gets killed or no, perhaps no one is even threatened, although it's a good question as to how so many of these idiots get to Congress. We know that Marjorie Taylor Greene made it to Congress through threats. So presumably some of the rest of them do too. Uh, but then you're just talking about, well, that's just a total coup. So you're you're elsewhere. Maybe it's peaceful, maybe it's not. But, you know, what if Trump controls the minds of a major vast majority of both houses of Congress? Uh, then I don't know. Then we lose. All right. Well, anyway, that wasn't really where I meant to turn to. I had other things that uh, were off of that path. And before we get to Joan, let's see. For one thing, uh, I let's see. I've scared, you, scared the hell out of you with this this morning. I meant to – remember I scared the hell out of you yesterday with – the Russian ultimatum. Uh, first of all, I should say I'm still unclear on the date and I'm still unclear on whether there is a hard deadline. The Russians in every write-up I've seen about it keep insisting that there isn't a hard deadline, but yet they're going to blow some stuff up. So you'd think that they would want to give, you know, some deadline somewhere. But, you know, I couldn't find it anywhere. Uh, but maybe January 6th isn't the deadline. That would be awfully convenient. I mean, that would scare the hell out of me. And I did scare the hell out of you yesterday by saying, well, OK, on December 17th, they delivered these things. And then somebody mentioned a 20 day deadline. But I think the 20 day deadline came from the Daily Beast story. And I think the Daily Beast story was written well after December 17th where somebody says, well, we're 20 days out from the deadline. And the 20 days out from when that person said it puts it more like January 9th or 10th. So I'm not certain at all that it has anything to do with January 6th, but that would be an awfully convenient moment if there were problems to make your move. Oh, I said the deadline was going to be the 10th, but who the hell cares? This is the whole thing is about threats and illegality, so... Just like with the Electoral Count Act, uh, F it. We'll uh, move the deadline up to today and we'll use our awesome hypersonic weapons to blow up American ships in the Black Sea or whatever it is that they're actually threatening. Uh, so one, I wanted to point out that uh, January 6th wasn't necessarily the deadline. Two, I will mention the fact that there's a weird case now pending that has uh, Marcy Wheeler's attention, among others, um, and I will share it with you if uh, we can get the thing out of the way here. Oh, no. Oh, I'm sorry. I read this article yesterday on Bloomberg, and you know how it is. Now they won't let you read it again unless you go to the pocket view. Uh, here's the story. U.S. catches Kremlin insider who may have secrets of 2016 hack, which, uh, let's see if I can. Yeah, Henry Meyer. Irina Resnick and Hugo Miller are on the byline for this January 3rd piece in Bloomberg. <clears throat> and uh, it tells us this weird story. I mean, I guess here, too, we can make it long story short. 
Um, but just to set the, the, the tone here, in the days before Christmas, U.S. officials in Boston unveiled insider trading charges against a Russian tech tycoon they had been pursuing for months. They accused Vladislav Klyushin. That's my best attempt at K-L-Y-U-S-H-I-N. Klyushin. Vladislav Klyushin, who'd been extradited from Switzerland on December 18th. Keep that date in mind. You remember December 17th, right? On December 18th, he's extradited from Switzerland, having been accused of illegally making tens of millions of dollars trading on hacked corporate earnings information. Yet, as authorities laid out their securities fraud case, a striking portrait of the detainee emerged. Klyushin was not only an accused insider trader, but a Kremlin insider. He ran an information technology company that works with the Russian government's top echelons. Just 18 months earlier, Klyushin received a Medal of Honor from Putin. The U.S. had, in its custody, the highest level Kremlin insider handed to U.S. law enforcement in recent memory. That is very interesting. And that's all of uh, the preview that I can get through Bloomberg. But the long story short, because I can't read it to you, is, uh, if I can recall correctly from the uh, article as I read it yesterday, Klushin is accused of being one of the hackers that facilitated the 2016 break-ins at the Democratic National Committee um, computer system and stolen all the emails, et cetera, et cetera. Plus, um, you know, various other cyber intrusions as revealed by investigators in early days. Um, but, you know, he was beyond our jurisdiction. He was Russian and stayed largely in Russia. As it turns out, he is on vacation in Switzerland with his family, like skiing at some point, and is picked up by Swiss police on U.S. warrant, I guess. And uh, the, well, the, at first, the, like I said, the, in Boston, the prosecutors are prosecuting him for using his hacking skills to hack into corporate computers and, or, uh, or, or at the, um, uh, at the SEC, I think, and hacking into the computer system where corporations file their earnings reports you know, a day or two ahead of time so that they can be released, you know, from whatever central repository at the correct moment. But if you were able to get a look at them ahead of the announcements on quarterly earnings or whatever, then you could use that time to make trades and profit off of that insider information. That's what's being alleged by the Boston FBI, essentially. So he's picked up on that. But as it happens, he's also you know, connected to the DNC hack and, you know, they just thought they would never get him. So they get him in Switzerland and the Swiss have a decision to make because immediately now, despite the fact that he's been handed a medal of honor by Putin and he's an insider and everything, the, the Russians immediately play the same game. They say, oh, wait, 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 wait. Um, you have this guy in custody. I know the U.S. is trying to extradite him from Switzerland and that's probably going to work. But wait, before you send him to the United States, we have a competing and superior claim to him. We accuse him of fraud right here in Russia. Why, if you believe that he's that kind of fraudster in the West, boy, you ought to see what he's doing here in the East. And we know because we're the government. We've been investigating him for some time. And he was using <clears throat> his, ins you're accusing him of insider trading, right? He was an insider at the Kremlin and he was using the Kremlin insideriness to steal lots of money. That's how he became an oligarch. And we were okay with that because he was on our side, but then he stole some of our money or something. Anyway, the government of Russia wants him. Fraud. Uh, we're going to totally charge him. We're totally not going to uh, say that, well, he's a Russian citizen and he's wanted for justice in Russia. And so therefore the usual practice internationally is to honor that and send him back to Russia. And we're totally not going to drop the charges the minute we get him back. Oh, did I say that out loud? Well, apparently I did because Switzerland said, yeah, well, we're going to send him to the United States instead. So all sorts of twists and turns legally about all of this and who he is and whether he was or wasn't involved in the 2016 hack. Da, da, da. I just wanted to point that out, one, because it's a fascinating case, but two, that it was on December 17th that the Swiss 
system made clear through various, like I said, various twists and turns, some of which are very interesting all by themselves, including the fact that at some point the lawyer handling extradition on behalf of the Swiss government, but on the part of uh, Klusian, fails to make his filing in time, essentially, and files, you know, on paper as opposed to electronically, and whoops, misses the deadline about the Russian claims, and golly, that just leaves the Swiss with one possibility, and that's sending him to the United States. That happens on December 17th, and then, out of nowhere, seemingly to the rest of the world anyway, if not necessarily to those in the State Department who could debunk this theory, I'm sure, but... All of a sudden, uh, a new era dawns and Russia decides to flip the balance of power entirely. And by the way, look over here, nuclear war. That'll distract you from hanging on to this guy. Or that'll dissuade you from uh, enjoying your victory in court in Switzerland and extraditing this guy and actually getting a hold of him and taking jurisdiction over him. Why don't you just send him back to Russia where he belongs and we'll forget this whole thing happened with this treaty over here. Is there an extradition that I could have in this hand that would make you say, what is, what is this treaty that I have in the other hand? And just forget all about that. It could. I don't know. I don't know. Just that I wanted to throw out there as a possibility for you. Um, let's see. Before we turn our attention to a visit from Joan, I also wanted to throw out this piece of information because it wouldn't it be irresponsible if I didn't. I just wanted to tell you that as the right wing uh, gets ready to gear up in two days, I guess, was they do their commemoration of the January 6th insurrection. And uh, I have pointed out to you, have I not, that uh, that uh, Trump will be commemorating the date in a press conference from the scene of Jalen Maxwell's uh, sex trafficking crimes. I thought that was an odd choice of venue, but then again, it's his house, which you should, you could take one of two ways. Well, of course he's doing it, you know, Republicans, well, of course he's doing it from Mar-a-Lago. That's where he lives. And I will say, well, of course, Jalen Maxwell committed god-awful sex trafficking crimes at Mar-a-Lago. It's his house. That's where he lives. He's now chosen to make it his domicile. We should be hammering that, by the way, but apparently we don't care about this thing. Anyway, one of the things that they'll be doing is celebrating Ashley Babbitt as a martyr. And I'm here to tell you, because it would be irresponsible for me not to, that though she was gunned down in the prime of her life, she was no angel. Can you believe it? They actually did some investigating into this. I think I've heard some of this before, too. So we'll just annoy the reporters who did it first. Uh, but instead, I'll give credit to the AP and uh, Michael Biesecker. Is that his uh, B-I-E-S-E-C-K-E-R? His piece, Ashley Babbitt, a martyr. Her past tells a more complex story. So let's tell a little bit of it, at least get you the flavor of it. You probably guessed this, quite honestly, that nobody puts themselves in the position that she was in without being something of a, you know, loose cannon and a bully. Well, you were right. Here's how the story begins. The first time Celeste Norris laid eyes on Ashley Babbitt, the future insurrectionist had just rammed her vehicle three times with an SUV and was pounding on the window, challenging her to a fight. So she's shrinking Violet, uh, our poor martyr, right? Norris says the bad blood between them began in 2015. When Babbitt engaged in a months-long extramarital affair with Norris's longtime live-in boyfriend. When she learned of the relationship, Norris called Babbitt's husband and told him she was cheating. She pulls up yelling and screaming, Norris said in an exclusive interview with the Associated Press, recounting the July 29, 2016 road rage incident in Prince Frederick, Maryland. It took me a good 30 seconds to figure out who she was. Just all sorts of expletives telling me to get out of the car that she was going to beat my ass. Terrified and confused, Norris dialed 911 and waited for law enforcement. Babbitt was later charged with numerous misdemeanors. That, by the way, that window she didn't break and try to climb through. Just the one in Congress. But uh, that's one of her things, uh, violently cornering her quarry and challenging them to get out and threaten them with physical violence. 
But we don't know how she found herself in Congress that day. Golly. Bad, you know, bad cop. Bad man. Good shoot, folks. Should have done it and more. The attack on Norris is an example of erratic and sometimes threatening behavior by Babbitt, who was shot by a police officer while at the vanguard of the January 6th riot at the U.S. Capitol. Former President Donald Trump and his supporters have sought to portray her as a righteous martyr who was unjustly killed. Well, we don't go in for that here, of course. Trump has called her an, in, an incredible person and even taped a posthumous birthday greeting to her in October. Trump has also demanded the Justice Department reinvestigate Babbitt's death, though the officer who shot her was cleared of any wrongdoing by two prior federal investigations. But the life of an Air Force veteran from California who died while wearing a Trump campaign flag wrapped around her shoulders like a cape was far more complicated than the heroic portrait presented by Trump and his allies, and we knew that was going to be the case. No one shows up at something like that with a Trump flag around their neck as a cape and is a uh, normal, good, and stable person. I mean, we all kind of knew that. Anyway, uh, we don't really have to dive into all the details, uh, but I welcome you know, I welcome the opportunity to read the rest of it at some point. Uh, you should probably do the same, but we'll use more of our time for a sampling of other stories from around the uh, blogosphere. One thing that happened yesterday also, just by the way, you know, Another tick mark in the Trump is crazy and he's not a normal person category. Um, not the worst thing in the world, but also just, again, not good and doesn't belong in the presidency. Another, I guess, chalk this up to president, do not congratulate, has done it again. As Trump offers unusual endorsement of Hungarian Prime Minister Viktor Orban ahead of parliamentary elections. Not done by American presidents, but of course he's not a president, and maybe he never was. Uh, but even if he were still claiming to be president, well, he is still claiming to be president, but even if we were all pretending that he really was, as we did for the past couple of years, uh, it's not something that a sitting president ever does, but he says, to hell with it, I'm going to do it anyway, because there's no law against it, and even if there was, I would pardon myself for breaking it. So anyway... That's something. It's interesting. Uh, Orban, pretty clearly uh, very fascist and right-wing in his own leanings. And no surprise that he uh, is in favor of him, but uh, just thought I would mention it, right along with the whole idea of, oh, um, the Russians may be, you know, planning to launch some kind of uh, preemptive strike against Western forces or maybe specifically American forces. And it might happen around January 6th, and they may also say something like, well, if Donald Trump was president, this definitely wouldn't have happened because he would have made a great deal with uh, Vladimir Putin, which is entirely possible that that might ha not have happened if he were the president, but only because of the corrupt nature of their friendship. So it's not very helpful to point out that it might not have happened under Trump because it wouldn't be like, oh, well, we would have been safe from, you wouldn't have perhaps not have been vaporized in the same way, but you wouldn't be safe. But maybe you would trade, you know, alive and unsafe for vaporized and unsafe. There are people who might come to that uh, conclusion independently and uh, perhaps in a valid way. I don't know. Anyway, a couple other stories to share with you. I'm going to have to pocket a couple of these for another day because they deserve uh, more in-depth coverage. We are, of course, almost at the break. And when we come back, we'll be speaking with Joan McCarter. And then we'll want to switch over to happenings in the current Congress, uh, what uh, Schumer may or may not have in store, although it might be the case that she would rather go back and discuss some of these other things. We're totally open to that, too. It's her segment. I'm just I'm just hanging out and having a good time. One more thing I guess I'll throw in as we wait for the time to run out and music to come in and take us away. Washington Post piece from Drew Harwell caught a lot of eyes yesterday. Since January 6th, the pro-Trump Internet has descended into infighting over money and followers. Far-right influencers and QAnon devotees are battling over online audiences in the power vacuum created by Trump's departure 
from office. It's good to see um, weirdo Republicans uh, or any Republicans for that matter in disarray, though it's not nearly as alliterative as Dems in disarray and therefore not as popular, but very true. And uh, among the accusations flying yesterday, I don't know whether this had anything to do with this story or not, but for some reason, Dan Crenshaw, uh, of whom I am not a particularly a fan and none of us really are, uh, I guess decided to spit out the truth yesterday, pointing out that Marjorie Trader Green was herself one of these online grifters and was using her outrageous statements to get herself banned from Twitter and then using her ban from Twitter to raise funds. And he was basically saying, yeah, she's a grifter and uh, you ought to be ignoring her. Not going so far as to say that he would vote to expel her, though he ought to. Just thought that was interesting. Hi everyone, it's me, Gil, minimal contributor to content, but regular contributor to funding for k in the Morning. Let's change things up from David's so very tired plea for your contributions with a plea of my own. If you want to add your voice to the show, do it. Record your own segment using your favorite recording device and send it to David. Read an article and give your opinion. Write your own essay and read that. The sky's the limit. Well, not really. Try to keep it relatively short so David doesn't have to stress about cutting it and hurting your feelings. Join the hallowed ranks of Greg Dworkin and Joan McCarter and be part of this somewhat witty deep dive into political topics with unnecessary censoring. Lend your voice to the show by sending it to kagrox at gmail.com. K-A-G-R-O-X at gmail.com. Welcome back now to the Kegro in the Morning Show here on Netroots Radio. All right, Joan McCarter joins us uh, back in uh, back in place at the microphone back in your own house. That's good news. I, uh, I know your your life was disrupted recently with the uh, household emergencies. We missed you last week, but now we have some big news. So we need to give uh, Chuck Schumer a week or so to get himself together. So. <laughs> happy New Year. Yes, I, I can say you. Happy you New too. Year because I'm in my house. Yes, that's right. And you've had now this uh, emergency would have fallen very close to your birthday as well. Right? <laughs> yes, I was say, indeed. Well, happy birthday. Was it on your birthday, actually? Or uh, I can't remember day what day before, this is. So the day after okay. Christmas. And, Ugh. Okay. Uh, yeah. Ah. Well, Quite anyway. Fighting and this extended the problem with yeah. an arc blast. Well, yeah, I guess that'll... Uh, That'll ruin anybody's day. But uh, sorry about that happening uh, on or around your birthday and hope the rest of it was happy. But okay, glad you're in, glad you're safe <laughs> and sound. It'll all be delayed. It'll be fun. Start over, we'll, right? It'll be a distant, awful memory. <laughs> okay. You know, and I, I, I would imagine you're good at compartmentalizing as a December 27th birthday person. Well, yeah, mm-hmm. on the birthday thing, yeah. Yeah, yeah. okay. I, I am also at the stage where I just assume they not happen, <laughs> so, you know. Yeah, I guess there's that. Okay, well, uh, but from early in childhood, you probably got used to the idea of, all right, well, uh, where, did you ever did you ever defer celebration of your birthday for a later date when you were a kid? I know somebody who does that. We so. tried that once, Yeah. having a half birthday, and it just, I mean, it didn't yeah. really... Oh, okay. didn't really work. <laughs> I'm just wondering. Okay. Well, you know, <laughs> we experiment with procedural change from time to time. Uh, <laughs> yes, we do. Something in the news. Something in the news. Chuck Schumer seems to be convinced that he can make it happen. He can hmm. get, or at least try to get okay. 50 of his senators on board with at least a filibuster carve out for voting rights. Okay. All right. That's so that's the general design of the plan he hopes to execute. A carve out for voting rights. I have not seen anything Probably. That... I mean there are a few things that they're talking about. I don't see them having any luck getting cinema and mansion on board yeah. any kind of broad filibuster reform. It's just not gonna happen. All right, so they'll try for the narrowly tailored thing. I haven't seen anything that indicates that he would go in for even, you know, the the straight carve-out thing, but who knows what kind of curveball could be thrown in 
to the procedure or writing themselves some sort of one time only ticket, whether that's real or that not. That might be a thing, like they just did on the debt ceiling. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's that's one of the things that a lot of groups have seized upon, saying, yeah. "Look, you just did it. <laughs> you just did it for the debt ceiling. Remember the convoluted, crazy I do. House passing the thing that gave the Senate permission to break the filibuster for this one time only for the debt ceiling." Yes, the uh, most ridiculous thing I'd ever seen. It's it was very odd for a number of reasons, but yeah, but even so, that one like, eh, that one I think. Well, the Republicans gifted you that. They what if they don't gift you this? So something else. But but you know if it if the confusion serves, maybe you take advantage of it. Sure, uh, that same procedure won't work because the Republicans gifted you the first one. But suppose you do something different but say it's the same thing (laughs) people say we don't know what you're talking about (laughs) i I don't know how that exactly works and i still don't really understand the rationale Hmm. for how 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 it made the difference to mcconnell of you know getting the house permission to do it was the thing that said he could say okay you can do it with 51 votes i don't really but because he could have stopped that yeah and he just I don't understand to, so. anything that the Senate does anymore, Kegro. Mm. I just mm. don't. Yeah. Well, it's hard to when none of the things, you know, when rules get inconvenient, you I guess I guess for this we'll say, well, both sides when both when rules get in to be inconvenient, they change them. Well, yeah, they they do. So that does make it difficult to explain what's going on except to catalog the changes as they're made, but Eh, ultimately, is that really any what different? What is it, 161? Is that the number of exceptions to the filibuster that currently oh. exist in Senate rules? I don't know. That's a good question. Uh, I, think, I think it's 161 that? carve-outs that there are. Huh. I, I mean, I know of a few, but I imagine because they're so obscure, there could be many, many more that I just don't know about. Um, um but, you know, I like thinking things that we've discussed before in the past, like the Congressional Review Act has a right. it's a, all it is is you put a time limit. If you statutorily say uh, whenever you discuss X, Y, Z items in the Senate, uh, you're time limited to X number of hours. Whatever the number is doesn't really matter. If there's a limit, then there's no filibuster. So right. they probably got in the habit of that and wrote. 15 and 20 of them at a time once they discovered it as a as a tool it's just they don't deal with those subjects all that often and they're and they're narrow and when they do deal with them they're now routine and nobody cares and doesn't get any reporting it won't help you on voting rights so yeah it's not something as big as supreme court justices yeah. which of course we don't have the filibuster for anymore thanks to Mitch McConnell mm-hmm. and and all of his republicans um, which isn't necessarily a bad thing. You and I have yeah. been arguing for filibuster reform for a really long time. Yeah, I mean, we're okay with, with that one. It's, uh, it's, we, we and, knew we and, would and, lose it. You know, it, it does allow us to say, oh, look, hypocrisy again. Yeah, right, to the extent that... <laughs> which that, which mm, doesn't which... work for anybody, not even <laughs> Joe Manchin. You can't point to the non-existent filibuster on Supreme Court justices for Joe Manchin and say, look, see, that happened. Yeah. What you're saying is ridiculous because um, he doesn't, he doesn't yeah. listen. Yeah, well, I'm still not going to do it. Uh, but it still right. exists, and, you know, there's there's some utility in calling out hypocrisy, mm-hmm. even though, you know, right. you it never really know. doesn't make any difference to Mitch McConnell. Yeah, I mean, if it's, uh, if it's all situational, you know, you just keep trying and, and do it again and hope you land in one of those situations, like with the uh, debt ceiling. I don't know what it is. They could have blocked the whole thing, but situationally, they've decided that it's better for them not to. So try it. It's hypocrisy, <laughs> but, you know, in this case, we got what we wanted out of it. It may be I- the same with filibuster carve-out. You said you didn't want to do it, but... They forced you with that crazy thing that just happened with the debt ceiling, and I don't know what happened, and I, but I felt I, I was forced to vote the, to do it. The, okay. The it one thing about it is that it really is now. I think just Mansion and just Cinema. Yes. I mean, we still have point. Feinstein out there. 
not being entirely sure what's going on, I mm, think. Maybe. Who sort of yeah. will revert to previous talking points when somebody sticks a microphone in her face. But I, I don't think when it comes down to it, she's going to be a barrier. That could be. Yeah. I mean, we've got Coons, we've got thing. Carper, we've got pretty much everybody recognizing that this has to happen. And that's a recognizable historical pattern. It's the way it happened in 2013. For a long time, there were eh, lots of movement towards it. Then, But then you discovered late in the game, there are some foot draggers here. And then when the traditional foot draggers said, even I will vote right. to do this, they said, all right, well, let's go. Yep. So that's where we're at. Um, okay. I do know that the group that has been working on this, Merkley, Kane, King, Klobuchar, mm -hmm. all of the people with K's in their names, yeah, um, have been still over the break talking with Match and trying to figure out what it is Match and would agree to do. Mm -hmm. um, we had the hiccup of Matchin's bloviating on Fox News about how he was going to oppose Build Back Better that was probably uh, yeah. a setback on everything. Um, but mm. again, whether Manchin really means that, whether he's really, mm. <sighs> we should start a Feinstein rumor about him. Well, that's what it says when <laughs> we you stuck him on TV, <laughs> but who knows what, which Manchin's going to show up when push comes to shove and then they, they throw him out, push him out on the floor there. His staff knows how to instruct him. As, as far as I can <laughs> tell, it's just a lazy intellectually incurious guy who likes a lot of media attention doesn't necessarily do his homework before sense. he goes in front of cameras and just says what comes into his head that sounds hmm. like like the inflation thing on ah, build back yeah, better okay he heard that somewhere he repeated it he decided okay this is my line right. even though you know every nobel prize winning economist that's still alive says yeah no Build Back Better is not going to be inflationary. Mm -hmm. And lots of other analysts. That That's... was Manchin's shtick. He got it yeah. into his head. It was the thing that was easy to fall back on. It sounded smart. So that's what he says. Sure. I mean, it's like saying if you really were unprepared and we, we you know, suppose we just convinced one of you in the audience, you're a senator and you're a conservative <laughs> senator and, you know, push you out there. If you didn't know what to say and you said, um, I just don't want to pass this debt on to our children and our children's children, right? Right. This is the sort of thing that people say, that's things that senators say. He must be okay. I mean, mentally, like he's not completely lost. If yeah, he just, you know, lives in the easy cliche. Again, yeah. I really think he is, I don't know that he's not very bright, but I do think he's really lazy. Hmm. All right, well. Uh, there are such people, <laughs> and uh, sometimes they land in the Senate. <laughs> and uh, <find> <laughs> and then there's Kirsten out. Cinema, Kirsten uh, Cinema, rather. Yes, the Lord only knows. Her 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 objection has been that if we do all of this, the Republicans are just going to come in and repeal it. Yeah. Which, well, yeah, so but if problem? we do all of this voter protection stuff, perhaps Republicans don't get the majority again. That might help. That's true. And it stands, and it can't be repealed. <laughs> and, yeah, well, uh, so... You could try that. Yeah, I don't know why... Uh, yeah, I, I, honestly. I mean, to me, that's like, great, fantastic. I mean, then... No harm, no foul. If you believe that they will repeal it, uh, we're going to be back at the status quo. But if you believe it'll work and they won't win and then they can't repeal it, even better. So what's the issue? Exactly. I don't know. Well, she, I don't want to be. Again, she's a mystery. We've talked about it every single Tuesday for I don't know how long. Mm -hmm. She makes no sense. Yeah. But anyway, Schumer is one way or another, going to try to break the filibuster on voting rights, the, the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act and the Great. Freedom to Vote Act, the bill that Mash has specifically structured out of the For the People Act because he said he could get Republicans on board, um, to try to get both of those done on or before 
Martin Luther King holiday, which is January 17th. Ah, okay. So, yeah, that helps explain the, the timing, good use of the, the calendar. He's also, I think, and it's it sounds crass to say it, but I think it's probably effective trying to use the specter of January 6th hmm. to demonstrate how critical these yeah. reforms are. And that sort of goes back to what you were talking about with Armando earlier with the uh, Electoral Reform Act. Uh, you no. listen to that? Electoral <laughs> Control. Well, what Electoral is Count Act, I think. Electoral yeah. Count Act. Thank yes. you. <laughs> um, which, I, I, I'll be honest, I haven't really had on my radar until now. And DMs from Greg Sargent saying, Mark Elias doesn't know what he's talking about. Uh, <laughs> mm. Have well, you need to look into it deeper? Um, that's got to happen, too. Okay. Well, uh, yeah, I better look at that myself. Uh, the, yeah, what do you do? Like, okay, that'll conflict. Mark Elias and Greg Sargent both saying the other one doesn't. Somebody know One of these two knows what they're talking about. Uh, both of them really do. So I, I wonder what that issue is. I think they both really do. I think Mark Elias is saying the that from his standpoint, it looks like because all of the conservative sort of thinkers and and the kind of people Mitch McConnell listens to are pushing the Electoral Count Act reform mm -hmm. that he's thinking McConnell is going to try to offer that up as a compromise for not doing John Lewis and Freedom ah. to Vote Act. And, um, all right. Which I haven't seen any evidence of yet. Mm. But I think that there is maybe some coalescing among conservatives, particularly McConnell types, who don't want to see Trump come back to, to Trump-proof the next election. Hmm. And the ECA reform would be a way to do it. I see. Um, from my All perspective, right. ECA is, is necessary, but it's not sufficient to secure the next elections. I think we yeah, also okay. have to have the other two. So, so I, I, I agree with both Craig Sargent and Mark Elias and yeah. our motto that has got to be done, but I don't think that it's the only thing that's going to save us. It could Trump proof us in 2024, but you know, every state, but one last year, had their legislature consider a voting restriction bill. Mm -hmm. the, the 49 states yeah. had these bills before them. There were 440 of them. Yeah, like, um, well, you won't really have to reform the Electoral Reform Act. Uh, that, that doesn't become an issue if 49 states send electoral votes based on, you know, a, a minoritarian <laughs> vote version. Phobia. Yeah, yeah. right. Uh, yeah, so that can't be. Yeah, it can't be the end all, be all. Uh, it's it's a good thing to do, and one track of what has to happen. But yeah, you know, even if you had a bulletproof electoral count act, and millions of people were denied their right to vote, where are the happy, contented citizens in all of this? Right. I mean, maybe that's not something we can grant everybody, but everybody will certainly say, I understand that the electoral vote count is going to go smoothly, but frankly, that should have been going smoothly anyway. Uh, you've identified a different and frightening problem out there that exists. But in the meantime, you know, we were supposed to have the right to vote and we don't. And that's your fault. I don't right. know how well they're going to take that. And if we lose Congress in 2022, hmm. um, 2024 is, <laughs> right. I don't know that 2024 is a luxury we can be prioritizing right now, yeah. not a luxury, but I don't know and? that it's, it's the election that has to be at the top of the list right now. Yes, Trump-proof things, um, but first we've got a Republican-proof Congress for yeah. 2022. Well, that's true. That's the big issue. And, uh, of course, you're never going to get Republican agreement on that. So, uh, but th that's, that's the problem. And as others identified, as Kyle Cheney in his, uh, article, I guess, I don't know whether he meant to make this assertion or, uh, but you, I think he'd agree. 
Supposing you, I mean, if you lose control of Congress in 2022, but first you fix the Electoral Count Act, well, Kirsten Cinema will tell you what's going to happen. They'll unfix it in time for right. 2024. Or just say, let's not unfix it. Let's just ignore it in 2025 instead. Right. Yeah. So, right. I, I think Kyle was saying it might not be such a thing as Trump proofing the Electoral Count Act. And he may have a point there. So why not refocus on. Uh, undermining the you know any claims to legitimacy of what they're doing or what they might do in 2025 by stopping them earlier by uh, not permitting them to uh, perhaps say win a majority in Congress or overwhelmingly voting for the Democrat in 2024 and right. you know, with like legitimate votes that are supposed to count and if they try to not count them there could be outrage you want that. So I think you're right there. Uh, it can't be either or. And I guess to the extent that those guys are fighting over it, I think that might be foolish, but we'll see what the nuance it might be, of it yeah, is. Yeah, I did. I think what Elias was trying to do was, was preempt any thought on Manchin or Cinema's part that this would be the acceptable mm. Compromise, I which I'm, again you can't do. I mean, how how are you going to convince those two of anything? <laughs> yeah, <I don't laughs> That's got to be coming from inside the Senate itself. And I do really think that there's a core group of committed Democratic senators who are willing to put that effort in with mm-hmm. Manchin and possibly with Cinema. I don't know if she's talking to them. Um, yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, they might have more success with Manchin than. In cinema, but I, don't, I, I, don't I think whether... the thinking is she's not going to want to stand completely alone. Yeah, I could. See and that. I, I hope that Possibly, that's valid maybe. thinking. Um, she's enough of an oddball that it might not be, but it's certainly worth a try. I, and she's she's Even got to mansion. see her vulnerabilities in Arizona. I, mean, yeah. I I can't imagine she doesn't have an inkling. Yeah. That she's in jeopardy in Arizona from a primary, and also that she probably can't really count on mm. Republican votes to keep her in. I maybe I don't know. Hopefully, mm. somebody around her who she listens to is able to tell her this. Yeah, well, mm. hope so. Jeez. Uh, well, it's as good a strategy as any. It's uh, you know neither one of them are one you want to uh, bet the farm on you know, changing their mind, given the kind of digging in that they've done and the statements that they've made. But if you can get one, you got to try to go for it and see if some sort of magic rubs off and gets the other one to move. Um, you know, if the same logic happens to convince them both, terrific, no problem. But yeah, it's difficult to know. I, I It's easier to imagine uh, because more Democratic senators and conservative-ish ones by our standards uh, at that are saying, yeah, I have a real relationship with Joe Manchin and I'm talking to him, trying to do the best we can and I'm treating him seriously and everything just like he likes. And, and Right. Uh, yeah. But Tester's n- been in on it. What's odd is that n- nobody says, yeah, I have a real relationship with Kirsten Cinema. Mm. We're talking mm-hmm. it out. You know, <laughs> no. I don't know anybody that says that. <laughs> So no, <laughs> that's weird and uh, a little bit disturbing. I think a couple of Republicans have tried to claim that um, might just be, you know, baloney, but uh, it's of no use to well, us. Well, so. she reportedly does talk to McConnell pretty regularly. Yeah. I d- Puts her hands on What that too. means, who knows? Okay. Yeah. Well, it right. won't be of much help to us uh, unless, you know. Who knows? Maybe uh, at some point, even McConnell says, sure, reform the Electoral Count Act. And yeah, I guess that's the warning. If he says to her, well, why don't you just do this and that'll take care of the problem? Oh, OK. Well, you know what? Or if he like the uh, debt ceiling says, we'll get out of the way of the filibuster for a change to the Electoral Count Act. And then you can say you fixed the elections. You know, yes. in a good way, <laughs> not, not the bad way. And I do think it's a valid concern to look at this and say that could be what what is gonna what they're angling for. Um, mm. I don't know. All right, know. but we yeah, just have to watch and see. Mark Elias is not stupid. No, by no means. And he Greg's he Arkansas. was counsel for Harry Reid. 
So yeah. he also knows McConnell is an enemy. Um, mm-hmm. All of which Greg would agree to, I am sure. Yes. It's just a matter yes. of, uh, I don't know, I always forget. Once somebody told me that they were, it's not interchangeable to discuss tactics and strategy. Uh, and then I forgot what the definitions were. And I almost <laughs> always afraid I wrote, Name the wrong one, but I think they're disagreeing on tactics. <laughs> I have that problem too. Isn't that weird? Now, now that somebody said it has to be a problem, all, all I can remember is that I have not gotten it right. Right, same. I doubt I, myself. We forever. would never be generals. Yeah, well, there's a lot of problems that come with that too. You know, there are. <laughs> Besides which, you can take over your country as a colonel. I found that out in Libya. And uh, we have our own American Gaddafi, as it turns out. And he's a friend of, uh, what's his name? Mike Flynn's. And he was going to take over the country with Mike Flynn as well. You don't right. have to be a general. Don't worry about it. Until Trump ruined it all. Uh, <laughs> this, yeah, Lord. So, yeah, things are really scary right now. And mm-hmm. we lost Harry Reid. Yes. That was sort of a gut punch last week, to be honest. I yeah. mean, I was displaced out of my home because of aforesaid <laughs> plumbing issues in this right. teeny, 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 tiny Airbnb and already just sort of hanging on the edge. <laughs> yeah. And Harry Reid died. Uh, all right. Yeah, well, that was that was big news and big, uh, like you say, gut punch. A lot of very moving tributes in the last couple of days. Uh, we, I guess we kind of knew that time was coming. He wasn't in the greatest shape. Uh, these we days. did. He, he had beat pancreatic cancer for far longer than you could expect anyone to. Um, it was diagnosed in 2018, and usually, usually you don't get three years with that diagnosis. Um, so we had him for as long as we had him. He did some important stuff from afar, mm-hmm. um, including, you know, talking. I think to his former colleagues, uh, you really got to think about things like expanding the Supreme Court and getting rid of the filibuster for legislation. Yeah. You really need to be thinking about that. Right, right. And uh, I'm sure that he was convincing in a number of these cases, and maybe this is uh, what is you know, made some of the people We could be to... seeing that in Schumer's mm. willingness to have this fight now. Yeah. Uh, and I'm sure there would be a couple of senators who would, would say, well, you know, I really feel some... I, I was coming around to this position... And it was Harry Reid in many ways that helped me come around to it, and I feel an obligation to, to, to note that and to to do something about it to mark this. So that that could have something to do with it, and I'm sure he'll be invoked in any speechifying leading up to the maneuvers. We'll see. Provided the Senate can actually come back. <laughs> oh, what we've got Tim Kaine. Oh. Still stuck. <laughs> yes. He's been in his car for 19 hours, 20 hours now, 21 right. hours. <laughs> yeah, that does seem problematic. Uh, yeah, uh, I guess they'll and, wait for and him And we to also, arrive. Rob Portman was the latest. Rob Portman said this morning that he's been diagnosed with COVID. So yeah, uh, um, there's been a surge on Capitol Hill of Omicron yes. cases. Right. Like everywhere else. Like 13% positivity. No place positivity is immune from this one, it seems. So I don't. I, I'm kind of questioning how soon the Senate actually can come back. Hmm. Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, well, let's see. We got uh, two weeks or so, a little under two weeks to the 17th. Mm-hmm. And uh, this well, week they... might end up being a wash. Um, oh. This week might yeah. also. I mean, there there might be some who just want to stay awake out. too because of the anniversary that's coming up on Thursday. True. Also, right. Uh, Which I personally am dreading. Um, yeah. Uh, I, I'll use the opportunity again to remind everybody that the messaging uh, needs to be. It's weird that Donald Trump is giving his uh, press conference commemorating, of all things, the insurrection, but doing so from the uh, Delane Maxwell crime scene. That's odd as a venue. <laughs> Uh, but of course he lives there and that's because he lives in this den of iniquity. This was his choice and he turned it into a perv palace and he lives there now. Not coincidence, but I think we should point that out. You know, it's fresh in everybody's mind. This is where the sex trafficking happened and this is where he proposes, you know, everybody watch him give a press conference about overthrowing the United States government. That's crazy. Why are we doing this? So good anyway. point. I thought it was a good one. I 
Got it from uh, Twitter pal grudging one, as a matter of fact. <laughs> good point. Well done there. Uh, yeah. So, uh, well, we have a, a couple of weeks to hang on until we see Schumer starting to ratchet up the pressure. But, yeah, you're right. It might be a wash. Is, is, were the earlier waves of those who got COVID more recently, Booker and uh, Warren, are they back? Are they healthy? Um, I, they were both ill. I don't know how ill. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that they would be out of quarantine now, provided they're recovered. Yeah, I well, I'll have to check on them. So, right, uh, I mean, Portman is another announcement, but they'll try to be courteous to one another on both sides in terms of getting work done if people are out. So, yeah, you're right. This might be a wash. I hope that doesn't set things back. But I guess the decisions have been made about what side people are going to be on. And you can still call Joe Manchin on the phone even if you're not working. Yes. As long as Tim Kaine can keep his phone charged. <laughs> and doesn't <laughs> run out of gas. for 20 hours. Yeah. Shoo. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, thank you, Joan. Thanks for coming by. And uh, glad you're resettled back in the house and all has worked out. And, so uh, am I. Yeah. So I'll am bet. I. <laughs> <laughs> I can imagine. But it's even better for you than for us to hear the news but uh, we'll check in with you again uh, next week find out if this week was a wash and uh, whether anything weird happened on Thursday and look forward to more developments on the filibuster front talk to you again soon absolutely thanks Kegra from networdsradio.com you have been listening to Kegro in the morning with Waldman. Well, all right. Thankfully, the West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy is up next. Justice Putnam takes you and say other directions, the ones that we weren't able to get to, including the very exciting looking news about materials given to the January 6th committee by Bernie Carrick. More that deserves another look. Tune in and hear what he has to say about it. We'll see you tomorrow.